As we all know, there is a relation between angles and distances that is very important in celestial navigation. I'm talking, of course, about the 60 nautical miles per degree relation. I already did two videos on the consequences of it, and this will be the third one. It may seem a bit like beating a dead horse, but I think it's not. This video will be slightly different. I'm going to clearly state three assumptions and then show you exactly what they imply. The assumptions will hopefully not be too controversial. I believe even most flat earthers usually agree with them. The conclusions will be a bit of a different story though. Well, let's go then. Assumption 1. What we see in the sky can be isometrically mapped onto a sphere. Have you ever heard of the celestial sphere or seen a globe of the night sky? Those illustrate this assumption perfectly. We can imagine a sphere surrounding us and map all the stars we see in the night sky onto that sphere. A single observer only sees roughly half of that sphere at once. But if multiple observers team up, they can find that the halves they see fit together and they can cover the whole sphere in a collective effort. The important word here is isometrically though. It means that the mapping between the sky and the sphere preserves some notion of distance. In this case, it means that the angular distances in the sky can be exactly reflected in the distances on a sphere. And this only works with a sphere. You can map the stars to other kinds of surfaces, but if the surface is not spherical, the distances on it will not match angular distances in the sky. There will be distortions. 2. There is a one-to-one -one mapping, a bijection, between positions on the surface of the Earth and points in the sky. This assumption can be quickly proven by simply pointing out such a mapping, and it's very easy. We just map every point on Earth's surface to the point in the sky that is directly overhead at some given moment. It is easy to see that it is indeed a one-to-one -one mapping. At any given moment, an observer in a given place on Earth has exactly one point in the sky directly overhead. And conversely, in any given moment, every point in the sky has exactly one GP, geographical position, the point on the surface where it is directly overhead. Thus, the mapping is a bijection. And for those of you who are thinking of protesting that maybe some points in the sky do not have unique GPs, I can only refer you to celestial navigation. Determining the GPs of the observed stars is an important step of obtaining a fix and the almanac will always give you a unique GP for any celestial body at any given moment. And finally, 3. The mapping from point 2 is an isometric mapping. More precisely, the distances between points in the sky are proportional to the distances between corresponding points on the surface. This one is simply the 60 nautical miles per degree relation, only phrased slightly differently. What we're saying here is that if we take two points on the surface, the distance between them will be proportional to the angular distance between stars that are in the zenith at those points. This isn't quite how the 60 miles per degree relation is usually stated, but it is equivalent, and I'm going to prove that to you. The usual phrasing of the relation is, for every 60 nautical miles traveled away from a star's GP, it will drop by one degree in elevation. Assume then that we are at point A, which is the GP of star X, which means that we have star X in the zenith. Let's now travel to point B, which is some number n of nautical miles away from point A. According to the relation, star X will be n divided by 60 degrees from the zenith at point B. But that also means that whatever star Y is in the zenith at point B, it is n divided by 60 degrees distant from star X. Thus, the distance between A and B is proportional to the angular distance between X and Y, and the ratio of those distances is constant. It is 60 nautical miles of, this, of surface distance per degree of angular distance in the sky. Great! So now that we've established what the assumptions are and that they are reasonable, let's see what their consequences are. The first consequence I'm going to prove is this. If those three assumptions are true, the Earth cannot be flat. And I can already hear the screams of the flat earthers watching this. The math is unrelenting though. If we accept the premises, we have to accept the conclusions. And now I'm going to show that the conclusion does in fact follow from the premises. I'll do this using a proof by contradiction. We will assume that our three assumptions hold and that the earth is flat. And we will reach a contradiction showing that one of our assumptions must be wrong. 
Since we accepted the three assumptions beforehand, the conclusion must be that the Earth isn't flat. So, let us start with point A somewhere on Earth. At some given moment, some star X is in the zenith at point A. Let us look at all points where star X is some angle alpha away from the zenith. By our third assumption, those points will be at a distance d, equal to k times alpha, from point A, with k being the constant ratio of 60 nautical miles per degree. All such points form a circle with point A in the center, and a radius of d. Let's denote one of the points on the circle by b. At point B, another star y is in the zenith. Let us now mark all points where star y is angle alpha from the zenith. As before, those points form a circle with the same radius d, which means that this second circle passes through point A, among others. Our two circles intersect at two points, C and D. Those two points mark the places on Earth where both star X and star Y are angle alpha away from the zenith. Let's denote the stars that are in the zenith at those points by Z and W, respectively. What is the distance between points C and D? Well, if the Earth is flat, we just have two triangles here, ABC and ABD. These triangles are equilateral. Each side of those triangles is the radius of one of the two circles, so all of them have length d. Thus, the height of each of these triangles is d times square root of 3 divided by 2, and so the distance between c and d is d times square root of 3. Great! Let's now look at the celestial sphere. Star X is somewhere on this sphere. Star Y is angle alpha from it. So let's draw all the points that are angle alpha from X. Those points form a circle, with Y being one of the points on this circle. Let's now draw a second circle, all points that are angle alpha from Y. This circle intersects the first one at two points that are angle alpha from both X and Y. They have to correspond to stars Z and W. So what is the angular distance between Z and W? Here's the thing. By assumption 3, that distances on the surface are proportional to angular distances in the sky, it should be alpha times square root of 3, but it's not. It can be calculated to be arc cosine or inverse cosine of cosine of alpha divided by cosine half of alpha. This is greater than alpha times square root of 3 for all alpha greater than 0. Thus we arrive at a contradiction. This distance cannot be both equal to alpha times square root of 3 and greater than alpha times square root of 3. Thus one of our assumptions is wrong, and that wrong assumption was that the Earth is flat. In fact, the three assumptions I outlined in the beginning imply a specific shape of the Earth's surface, and it can be formally proven. Remember the assumptions. 1. The sky can be isometrically mapped onto the sphere. 2. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between the sky and the Earth's surface. And 3. The mapping between the sky and the surface is isometric. Assumption 1 implies that the sky is isometric to a sphere. Assumption 2 implies that the surface of the Earth is isometric to the sky. And since being isometric is an equivalence relation, it means that the surface of the Earth is isometric to a sphere which, if we treat the Earth as embedded within Euclidean space, implies that the Earth is spherical in shape. There, it's proven. As long as you accept the three assumptions, you must accept that the Earth is spherical. And those three assumptions are cornerstones of celestial navigation. If you accept that celestial navigation works, you accept those three assumptions. And these assumptions imply that the Earth is a globe. Flat Earthers accepting celestial navigation? Welcome. To the globe. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Bye!